I I call this uh, February 6th meeting of the school board of the city of Charlottesville to order. The first um, item on the agenda is a moment of silence. So that, we're going to do that now. And the next is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, do we have a roll? Yes, Madam Chair, we have a roll. Great. I wanted to propose one agenda change, and that is under um, 9.1, we have board member comments, and I was hoping to change that to board member announcements, and so we just save the comments for the last board member comments, if that would be okay with you all. Mm -hmm. Like if there's an announcement that we should know, that the public should know about, um, so that came, is coming out of your well of knowledge and relationships. Is there anybody, okay, anybody have any objection to that? Okay, so we'll, um, the comments portion under 9.1 we'll just have as board member announcements. Do I need a vote to make that change? Okay. I, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I think we can just make that change. Okay. Okay, I guess we'll need to approve the agenda as proposed. I move for approval of the agenda as noted. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, great. And now we have comments from members of the community. I have um, a list that people signed up for, um, but at, after those folks have um, spoken, I will I'll give an opportunity to anybody else who would like to speak. Um, we encourage um, the Charlottesville City School Board welcomes comments from members of the community. Um, speakers are encouraged to keep their comments to three minutes, so please come up and say your name and your address. And um, Charles Kendig is first. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Pleasure to be here. My name is Charles Kendig. I live at 593 Rosemont Drive in Charlottesville. And we're now in the month of Martin Luther King's celebration. I'd like to open my comments with a, a phrase that I heard Martin Luther King speak. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. As a resident, I'm very concerned about what is currently occurring and not occurring in our public schools and the continuing gaps in the achievement levels of our K through 12 students of color versus their white counterparts. In my view, the evidence is overwhelming across our country that we need more African American teachers and principals to meet the needs of our underserved children and their families. We have only one teacher out of 10 that is African American, and the largest disparity is within the city of Charlottesville, where 38% of our students are African American However, only 13% of the teacher base exists to serve that segment of our community. I'd like to share some of the headlines you probably have seen, but I think they bring home the point of the funding needed and the commitment needed to our children. $1 billion in state funding will be provided to Virginia universities aimed at creating workers for Amazon and other tech firms. The funding is over 20 years. 16.6 16 million, 16 .6 million is to be distributed this year. They could be used, that dollar, those dollars could be used any way those universities want it to be used. Priorities and accountability. Where is it? I don't see it. Fully funding Virginia schools will cost $1 billion more per year. Can Democrats deliver against that commitment? Pay raises are great. Where is the money for additional teachers and principals of color 
to meet the needs of underrepresented groups. Charlottesville ended the most recent fiscal year with a $5.8 million surplus. A written, uh, an article, by, excuse me, was written by a gentleman named Chris Suarez back in December 6, 2016, four years ago. He referenced the budget surplus of $5.8 million. Since fiscal year 2010, the city has ended each year with a surplus of between 2.9 and $5 million. Budgeting, not sure the money is coming from effective budget management when you have surpluses for that long of time. How much money was designated to recruit and retrain teachers and administrators of color over that time frame? Who keeps track of the commitments? City Council spars over salary Sir? study and surplus decision Sorry. of 5.8. Yes, ma'am. Hi, it's been three minutes. I'm, I'm at three already? Yes, sir. Oh, wow. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mira Figaro. Figueroa. Figueroa. Hi, my name is Mira Figueroa, and I'm a. Hold I'm currently. Hold on. Before you, we cannot hear you, and we are very interested in making sure we can hear you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mira Figueroa. I'm currently a student at Burnley Moran Elementary, and I will be going to Walker next year. I support the idea of having a um, Walker playground because students are you have uh, students are working, and when they have their rest, they should be able to use their energy with a playground. Good job. Uh, I hope you support the fact of this school playground. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Those are the only people who have signed up to speak, and I am happy to, um, anybody else who would like to speak may come up now. And Anybody else like to speak? <laughs> you may come at the end. We have another opportunity for public comment at the end for those who are not, of course. Um, okay. Now we. Hi, all. Welcome. Make sure you state your name. Okay. Hi, my name is Eva Reed. Um, I support the idea of a Walker playground because at my school I'm also a Burnley Moon student um, and I support the idea of having a playground at Walker too because I see a lot of kids playing on the playground at Burnley Moran and I feel like they should have that same feeling at Walker. Thank yeah, you. That's right. Right. Would anybody else like to speak? We do have another opportunity for public comment at the end. Um, and for um, a special treat, we have a public comment period now on the 2020-2021 budget that nobody appears to have signed up for. Would anybody like to speak about the budget? Come on down. Please state your name, limit your comments to three minutes. Appreciate you coming by. Good evening, members of the school board, and thank you for this opportunity to make a public comment. My name is Colleen Gallagher, and I work with the Just Children Program at the Legal Aid Justice Center here in Charlottesville at 1000 Preston Ave. As you make important decisions about funding priorities for the upcoming school year, we're hoping you will prioritize the concerns of members of the communities in Charlottesville that LAJC serves, whose children make up about half of our student body. These community members have told us for years about feeling left behind, that programs and other systems in place at schools don't help to actually support their children. We hear the concerns of our families about unfriendly and negative school climates in some of our schools and the achievement gap that leaves so many of our children after high school, particularly those from the communities that LAJC serves, without the basic skills they need to be successful at work or in college. In a division that can bring 
so many resources to bear for our families and that has made so much progress towards achieving equity. They struggle feeling like their schools are not given the help they need while other schools seem to be flourishing. They want to have the same benefits from the schools serving their neighborhoods so that, many other, that so many other children from different neighborhoods seem to be able to access at their schools. Equalizing resources distributed to schools is not enough to fully address these concerns. This budget needs to be organized around principles of equitability, allocating resources in a way to correct these imbalances and repair the injustices that result from them. We applaud CCS for the equity commitments you've already made for the 2019-2020 school year. In the spirit of this focus, we urge you to push for transparency regarding funding allocation for school culture initiatives like PBIS, social emotional learning, and culturally responsive classrooms. This information about funding should be made public. We also urge you to prioritize advanced curriculum for more students. Finally, we urge you to carry your equity commitments forward into next year's budget, such as expanding the package of professional learning on school climate and culture and allocating resources to enable schools to put that training into practice consistently over time and bringing as many resources as possible to bear towards the goals for improving relationships and community while directing them to the schools that need them most. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Good evening, Dee Dee Smith, 2652 Jefferson Park Circle. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm giving you tonight just an update on some information that I've given you in years past. This is for this school year. And the two sources of, of data for this information comes from Ms. Powell, who uh, gives you, um, who it actually doesn't give you probably, but develops a spreadsheet every year on enrollment versus classrooms and um, on your own accountability report. So this is your information. And what it is is, uh, is looking at your the impact of your non-resident enrollment and the fact that you are actually not following your policies to um, enroll non-resident students or any transfer students within the city only when there is a seat available. Um, this data, which I've never seen it quite this bad, um, demonstrates that you have added 10 extra, you have 10 additional classrooms in your schools to accommodate non-resident students and city transfer students, but you don't even have to include them. It's non-resident alone uh, has that impact. And for a school system that's as overcrowded as you say it is, that clearly has a lot of implications and it has a huge budget implication. And my suggestion to you, and, and actually also on this data sheet, and I'm happy to share it with anybody here, um, shows a huge disparity between the schools where you, you uh, enroll the most non-resident students in terms of poverty, they're the lowest poverty schools versus the uh, three south side schools, the difference be between being between 22 and 36 percent poverty in the north side schools where you enroll most of those students in 85 and 86 percent poverty in the other three schools where the fewest of them are really, which you know shouldn't surprise anybody um, and and it is also impacting student teacher ratios such that you have in your low poverty schools lower student teacher ratios in some case than you do in your high poverty schools um, my my suggestion to you is to use this money to stop this policy to to adhere to your own policies and to use the money to test the children who are not learning to read. Ms. Torres, who does not appear to be here, gave an impassioned speech about learning disabilities. She called it personal. This needs to be personal for all of our children. There are, there's a whole industry out there to test children for why they are not learning like they should be that is open to people who have resources. We need to make that available to children who do not have resources because you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of children and it is not their fault. It is not their circumstances. They have the same issues that all children have. They just don't have the resources to find out what it what those barriers are. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to have an opportunity to speak? So I'm going to close public comment on the budget. Um, 
And I wanted to mention that Dr. Atkins, Ms. Torres, and Ms. Powell are all at um, the city work session tonight because the city is having a work session on the budget during our school board meeting. And um, that seems like super important to our interests. And so Ms. Torres, Dr. Atkins, and Kim Powell have gone over there to um, at assist um, city council if they have any questions related to the school's budget. Um, also, Tierra, our, um, our student school board rep is ill tonight, so she's not here as well. So we look really empty on the side of the <laughs> dais, so I apologize for that. But. Hold it down, Mr. Wayne. <laughs> He's got a lot of room over there. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood where everybody was today so that um, there's no questions about that. Uh, we are now going to go to educational highlights. And Dr. King. Good evening, Madam Chair, school board mem members, and Mr. Henderson. This month's education, educational highlight is a men passionately pursuing purpose initiative and I would like to invite Dr. Paul Harris, assistant professor and counselor of education at the Curry School of Education and Human Development, as well as Mr. Daniel Ferry, youth opportunity coordinator for the city of Charlottesville to please come up and share them about the initiative they are leading. Welcome, thanks for coming. You. Hi everyone, uh, good to see you all again um, and meet you, I didn't realize we met before. Hi. Uh, so my name is Daniel Ferry, I'm Youth Opportunity Coordinator for the City of Charlottesville, um, also President of the 100 Black Men, um, and with this program that Dr. Paul Harris is around here somewhere, come on. Um, so with this program, this was founded and created by Dr. Harris. Um, it's a program that has really great implications for our young men and our young athletes. Uh, so basically we are creating an eight week service in which we're meeting with the kids every week and talking to them about not just being eligible for college, but being prepared. And how can you kind of use your athletic identity beyond the field? Um, so maybe you understand yourself as the best safety in town or you know a great point guard, but how can you use some of those analytical skills that you have on the field or on the court into the classroom? Um, so that's all I'm gonna say. I'm gonna pass out a little sheet that has a brief rationale, some of the program and some measurements, uh, and then we'll have you all here from the real champions, uh, the people behind me. So thank you. Hi, welcome. Please say your name. Okay, I'm David Paz, um, student here at Charlottesville High School. Welcome. So good. Good evening. I would first uh, like to thank uh, Dr. Paul Harris and. Uh, Mr. Daniel for allowing me to be part of such a great uh, program and helping me find uh, the leader within me. Uh, MN3 was a very important program for me since it provided an environment where I could uh, learn more about what it meant to be a leader and um, how I could jump over barriers and show the world the leader that I was born to be. Before MP3, I didn't know what it felt like to be a true leader. I would be used as examples, uh, as like an example in class. Like I was going to the class, but never like I was never like a vocalized leader. Um, however, it wasn't until around uh, five weeks into the program where I earned the title of team captain of the wrestling team, um, which took a lot of you know self work and actually being a talented wrestler. But I give a lot of credit to MP3 because without it, I wouldn't be able to have accepted the title and felt comfortable holding it. Um, M3 also allowed me to make many connections in the fields of study I'm interested in, and those connections helped me uh, plan my future, and I now know, you know what, I, what I have to do and what I want to do uh, with the years to come. So MP3, yeah, did a lot for me. I will forever be grateful. This program needs to be experienced by more student athletes of color. Um, because MP3 can truly create leaders and it can also help find the leaders hidden within students, and I'm living proof of that. Thank you. Oh, right. Thank you. Welcome. 
Hi. Good evening. Um, my name is Jelio. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Professor Harris and mm. Daniel, Mr. Daniel, for um, accepting me to the program. Uh, MP3 is mainly about um, black and uh, people of color leaders, athlete leaders coming together, uh, just um, trying to um, improve our talents and uh, MP3 really taught me more uh, that it's more to it than sports. Uh, you got to think about like why you really started the sport that you played in and uh, uh, I remember the first day they had us write about uh, what, what are we without the ball. And it took me a minute to think about it, but I found out I'm a real passionate leader and I show it on and off the courts. Uh, this program really showed me like is a deep meaning to anything that you do. And I, I just want Thank, like, thank you, thank you guys. Uh, you really opened up my mind, and yeah. All right. Hi, I'm Chris Knox. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank, say thank you to Dr. Harris and Mr. Daniel, and most of all, the board for letting us, to, letting us continue throughout the year. I knew Dr. Harris and Daniel before the program started. I was always nervous because I felt like they held me to a different standard. But over time, I learned that the main goal is to see all, all of us become as strong athletic af athletes of color um, and leaders of our peers. I grew to understand that they saw something in me that I haven't saw yet. They have pushed me in many ways. I just don't see them as just a mentor, but as friends that will always have my back through, through anything. Uh, my bond with the peers in the group have grown exponentially. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Is Dr. Harris going to come up here and <laughs> accept some questions from the from the school board? I'm sorry. You're going to you're going to come up and accept some questions from the school oh, board. Oh, happy to. <laughs> <laughs> there was time for that. Yeah. How long has this been going on? How's your program? Uh, so it was kicked off in 2013. Oh, wow. Um, okay. and that was the first iteration of it and and we've been going since one year. Let's see. I co-facilitated with one of the counselors here the first couple of years and then trained some graduate students to do it after that. And then it was a short break. And then when Daniel came along, mm -hmm. uh, it seemed like a perfect fit to keep it going. And now we are, as on your one page, you're considering, we just submitted a grant proposal to actually extend the reach every year. Some of the data we get back from the young men is, thank you, it's been great, and catch us earlier. Right. So we, we are in conversations now with the middle school to extend both the reach in terms of how young we can um, connect with young men, but also the scope. So about 8 to 10 participate typically on a yearly basis, and we're hoping to double that number and then extend the, the length of the program to 12 months, uh, incorporating mentors and so forth, just to, to really extend what we know is beyond an eight-week experience. But that's where we are. Great. Are there any other questions for Dr. Harris, Mr. Faley, or the students? Sounds like a really awesome I'll program. Just comment. Um, you know, I'd like to applaud this effort. I, I think it's wonderful. And what I was hearing from you guys is, you know, you start off with this real, you know, strength in as an athlete, you know, and motivation as an athlete. And what this program allows you to do is connect that to other qualities and other aspects of being a leader and just sort of growing your character. And I just can't think of anything better than that. So um, I think it's fabulous what you're doing. And thank you for doing it. And one yeah, quick I just guys. like that one comment. So I, um, I like the young men that, you know, the way you're bringing out, I mean, being an athlete kind of automatically has some leadership, but you're really kind of making 
those skills really strongly transferable to other things. I think one of, one of the young men said that that they, you know, were used as leaders, as examples in the classroom, I think was said, but you all, you know, um, taught him to bring it out and to use it in different ways. And so I just see the confidence in these young men, and I think that's going to be just going to help them in a lot of different ways. I've just been hearing great things about this program, so, so keep it up. Anything that we can do as a school system to help you in your effort, just let us know. You know. So I'm glad that we have the partnership with the city and Daniel. Um, thank you. Thank you, brother. So keep up the good work. So. Appreciate it. One last quick thought. I know for me it's always a nice reminder of what we reinforce. And so we are huge fans of sports, um, and sometimes that can be uh, misunderstood in terms of the focus, right? And so what we always see in sports is the benefit of participation, but disproportionately we see students of color, one, drawn to sport, and two, not experiencing the same benefits sort of writ large. And so part of the underpinnings of it is to say there are benefits to be experienced, and for some reason students of color don't experience them the same way and find themselves more eligible to play versus ready for college. Interesting. And so that's kind of the underpinning of the program. And I think they're living proof of what's already in them that we get the privilege of pulling out of them. So thank you for the time to share and for the support moving forward. Dr. Harris, yes, I'd just Ms. like Perry. to say uh, thank you for explaining to the students that have been in your program since its inception. Not only are they athletes, mm -hmm. but they're people. Mm -hmm. And one of the young men said it best. What would I be without the ball? Mm. You will still be a strong young man with talent and leadership abilities because you may decide when you go to college that having the ball is not the way you would really like to go. And so often we just do not talk to our athletes about the next steps yeah. and what if I don't want to do this and I'm being pressured to do this what can I do? And I think that that has been one of the standouts for me since you began your program. And thank you for taking your time out of a very hectic schedule. I don't think people in this room understand what it's like to be an assistant professor, but to also give back to the community says a lot about you and your character. Thanks, Ms. Perrier, and thank you all. Thanks, y'all. Appreciate you coming. On. Thank you, Dr. King. Uh, we will be doing student and staff recognitions at this moment. Virginia Schools, School Principals Appreciation Week. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Governor Ralph Nordham has signed a certificate of recognition, which um, May, January 19th through the 25th, as Virginia Principals Appreciation Week. The role of the principal as an instructional leader is critically important to ensure our students are provided an opportunity to learn. Our principals work diligently to help students and teachers excel. And their leadership and hard work are essential to the success of our schools. They deserve all the recognition. This moment as well as much more of praise over what they give to others. Um, we do have some principals here. I have a list that I would like to read from and then also ask for the principals that are here to please join me up here at the podium. Okay, should I call their names? They're gonna, they're gonna <laughs> we have Dr. Hastings with Walker Upper Elementary School. We also have Dr. Jesse Turner with from Buford Middle School and Dr. Eric Irizarry right here at Charlottesville High School. Making sure I'm not missing anyone else. And we also um, to continue reading from our list of, of our elementary school principals. At Bernie Moran Elementary School, Dr. Elizabeth Corrad. Clark Elementary School, Deanna Isley, Greenbrier Elementary School, Pat Como, Jackson Via Elementary School, Dr. Justin Malone, Johnson Elementary School, Summerlin Thompson, Venable Elementary School, Dr. Aaron Kirshner, 
And at Lugo McGinnis Academy, we have Jill Dahl. So if you please could join me in giving them a hand for all the work that they do on our behalf. Um, again, the principals are instructional leaders of their building and they do extraordinary work every day and we're very grateful um, to be able to have a moment to celebrate the work that they do. So thank you to all of them who showed up today and for all of those who are not here. Um, we uh, Anyway, so we have the next thing, which is the uh, National School Counselor Week. Absolutely. This week, February 3rd through the 7th, is National School Counselor Week. School counselors have a tremendous impact in helping students achieve school success and plan for college and a career. They deserve all the recognition as well and praise that we can give publicly as well as individually. I have a list to read from, but I do have um, counselors that are present, and I would ask them to come on up and join me here at the podium. <laughs> we have Mr. Josh Epps from Buford Middle School. And working with him, uh, she has class tonight, Ms. Shamika Terrell at Burnley Moran Elementary School, Rebecca Barber, Clark Elementary School, Najra Tabby, Greenbrier Elementary School, Taylor Trent, Jackson Via Elementary School, Christian Ulrich, Johnson Elementary School, Allison Pillow, Venable Elementary School, Malika Redden, Walker Upper Elementary School, Mr. John Crowstein, Elizabeth Dinwiddie, and William Ulrich, or Bill Ulrich, at Lugo McGinnis, Maggie Wilson, at Charlottesville High School, Carrie Avakian, um, Sarah Elaine Hart, Brianna Hill, Melanie Key, Lisa Morales, um, who's also we recognize in the um, as she passed over winter break, um, and her celebration of life is taking place, I believe next week, um, tomorrow, thank you, Friday, um, February the 7th. Also, we have David Wilkerson at Charlottesville High School um, Counseling Department. So if you would please, one more time, just give them a, a hand clap for all the work that they do. Thank you, Dr. King, and thank you to all of our school counselors, especially in this season when we are all preparing for our uh, schedules next year. So um, thank you for all the work that you do. Uh, next, we have a very special Virginia School Boards Association School Board Clerk and Deputy Clerk Appreciation Week. Dr. Abs King. Absolutely. The third week of February has been designated as the Virginia School Board Association School Board Clerk Appreciation Week. Our school board clerk is Leslie Thacker, and our deputy clerk is Julia Green. Um, Ms. Thacker was, was, was helping me as board clerk. Uh, but thank you both. Thank you for working diligently to serve the school board, including ensuring accurate uh, meeting records, ensuring scheduling and notification reminders of where everyone needs to be, and numerous other duties that you take care of for us that you normally do, as well as the ones that's almost like a fairy in the behind the scene that just takes care of it. The board greatly, greatly appreciates both of you. And at this time, um, they serve us so well. If we could please just give them recognition with a hand clap. And we would like also to note that this is um, Ms. Thacker's last meeting as our clerk. Um, she's going to become the deputy clerk, and Ms. Green will be the uh, clerk starting in March. Um, I don't know what month we're in, so I think that's the February. next month. Next month. Um, maybe even the next meeting. I'm not 100% sure. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but to that end, I w really want to say a special thank you to Leslie Thacker, who has been our clerk for as long as I can remember. And then before that was her mother. So I feel like <laughs> it's just um, been a very long time that a Thacker has been at, um, the head of the table here and um, slash Bowen. <laughs> and um, I, we want to all say thank you and give you a big hug. Mm -hmm. Well, we also have something a little more than a big hug mm -hmm. for you. <laughs> Um, for all the grief that we've caused you, and that we hope that this will repair some of uh, the nuisance that we've been. <laughs> she said, "Is it a massage?" <laughs> we, we we've, we've given her no grief. It's a big check. It's not a big check. It's not a big check. No. It is. It is literally none of those things. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we really do uh, expect and ask a lot of our. Um, clerk and she has been doing double duty for the past several years and we're just very grateful and um, excited for her as she um, takes off one hat and puts on another hat. Um, thank you. And also, what is next? The National Celebration of Career and Technical Education in February. Dr. King. Absolutely. Governor Ralph Nordham designated February 2020 as Career and Technical Education Month for the, our Commonwealth and across the nation, um, Career and Technical Education, or CTE, is celebrated in February to recognize the achievements and accomplishments of the CTE program. Its theme for this year, 2020, Celebrate Today Own Tomorrow, and it provides Virginia schools an opportunity to showcase stories of excellence and communicate the, cru the crucial role of CTE and how it plays in preparing highly skilled, uh, highly skilled workforce for Virginia. It is, it's just at this time, I just want to say it's an honor to have a CTE program at the level um, that we do and just take time to celebrate the work the program accomplishes. So for our final hand phrase of this today, if you would please join me in a hand clap. Thank you, Dr. King. Thank you. Appreciate your time there. Um, we are going to move on to um, board member comments. Mm -hmm. You said announcements. I'm sorry, you're right. Board member announcements. I have that written down here as well. Um, okay. Do any board members have any announcements that the community might be aware want to be aware of? Say mm -hmm. Grace Tinsley, other things happening in the community over the next several weeks. There's that. Yes, um, I'll mention the Grace Grace Tinsley bash that would take place on February the 22nd at 6 o'clock. And Grace Tinsley was this incredible community um, force that did a lot, not only for Charlottesville School System, but for the community. And when she passed away approximately 10, 11 years ago, um, a group of her um, friends with her daughter established a scholarship in her name. And it's primarily directed for students attending college for the first time. And this bash that we have is an opportunity to raise money. And tickets are, I think, $40. And it's a great opportunity to come out and do the electric slide. and, and um, <laughs> With Juan. You get to yes. do with Juan. And all of, those, all of us, really. You feel like you're at a wedding. You're doing all those dances and things like that. So anyway, it's great fun. And you, um, you, um, we're going to have one of our former students Lakira Mills, who graduated from here three or four years ago, she's going to come and speak. She's a student at VCU, and so that you can see what your money is doing. So she'll be coming to speak. So this is a great opportunity to to raise money for a good um, cause. Thank you, Mr. Wade. Any other announcements? Yeah, I, um, I think this will come under announcements. Um, just with everybody here, um, I'd like to mention this. Um, I had the opportunity um, just very recently to travel to uh, Winneba, Ghana, in Ghana, which is um, one of our sister cities. Um, Charlottesville has a few sister cities, and Winneba, um is one of our sister cities, and it's um, 
you know, it was a wonderful trip in many ways, which I'd be glad to talk to you about. Um, one of the things that we do, we have a partnership uh, where we support them in a variety of ways, you know, with, you know, in the, in the medical area, we support their hospital, we support um, an orphanage there, so, and we support some entrepreneurial efforts. One of the things that has not happened is any kind of partnership in the area of education. Um, and I was able to meet with the education director there, and um, I'm hoping that we can begin something. We're not sure exactly what it is. They need so much in their schools, including things like toilets, which they don't have um, indoor toilets, but they, they need a lot. So um, I'm hoping that this can be the beginning of an effort, um, a partnership, and if anybody here or anybody who's listening or watching is interested in being involved with this, you can talk to me about it. And uh, we're not sure what it's going to be yet, but I think it's something that would be um, really rewarding. They can email you. They can email me or call me. Yes. Any other announcements? OK. Great. Now we're going to go to the consent agenda. Um, did you want to say anything, Dr. Mr. Anderson? OK. Um, consent agenda, any questions or action related to that? I move for approval of the consent agenda as listed. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? OK. Um, I'm going to move to the items for discussion. The first item on discussion is um, not Ms. Powell, but um, Walker Upper Elementary School Playground update. Ms. Ivory, how are you? Thank you for Good evening, Madam in, Chair. <laughs> <laughs> Members Good of the evening. board, Mr. Henderson and all here assembled. It gives me great pleasure this evening to present representatives from uh, Parks and Rec, uh, Todd, <laughs> and Todd Brown, <laughs> that's right, was supposed to be here as a representative from Parks and Rec, but he is home with the flu, so we wish him well and a speedy recovery. And thank you for staying home with the flu. That's right. We do have the parent organizer for the group, uh, Ms. Krista Bennett, who will come here and share, and I'm sure you've seen the Walker supporters, and we heard from the two young people, which was exciting. So we want to hear about this wonderful partnership and following which uh, the board can either request additional information or take action if it so desires. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Hastings, Ms. Bennett, come on down. You guys are up. <laughs> Uh, Krista is, uh, Ms. Bennett's never nervous, so she does not need me to introduce her. Um, I will say that um, I'm really happy and proud of the work that we've done uh, with Buford on the Walker Buford United PTO this year. Um, and, and really, uh, Krista's work has been, has, has been an outgrowth of, the, of that rejuvenated parent-teacher organization support that we have for Walker. And this is a, a really fun, neat project that's coming out of that work. And so without further ado. Thank you. Hi. How are you, Ms. Bennett? Good. How are you, Ms. Good. McKeever? Thanks for coming. <laughs> um, thank you to the board for giving a Playground for Walker the opportunity to present our proposal. Our goal is really simple. We want to build a playground at Walker. We've raised enough money to do so, and tonight we ask for your permission to build the playground. This initiative is a grassroots project, and in support of our request, I'd like to tell you a little more about how it's grown and who we're working with, and then I'll share with you our plans and the next steps we'll need to take to make this playground happen. And let me ask you, I just, can I navigate the PowerPoint right here? She can do it. Oh, good, okay, no. Um, yes, that's perfect. I'll give you, a, I'll just say, is that okay? <laughs> um, as some of you know from my previous advocacy to the school board, I am passionate about the crucial importance of play in Senate, making. Can yes. you speak? To oh, it's yes. Is that better? Yes. Just for, the, just for the people at home. Yeah. <laughs> I'm passionate about the crucial importance of play in making sure our children reach their full potential. The research is indisputable that having enough play time and access to play options is not only a part of physical health; it promotes brain development in our kids. It helps students better regulate their own emotions and actually improves their academic test scores. That's because play grows the brain itself in positive ways. 
In fall 2018, I learned that UVA was offering a grant to promote active and healthy living, and my mind immediately thought about Walker and its need for a playground. And as a professional grant writer, maybe I could get funding for it. My first step in exploring this possibility was stopping by the office of Walker Principal Dr. Adam Hastings. I asked him if a playground was something that students wanted, and his answer was an unequivocal yes. In fact, Walker recently had held a participatory budgeting process that engaged all sixth graders, and they identified a playground as one of the top things they wanted for their school. Principal Hastings said that he would love for students to have a playground too, so I told him, okay, I think we can get this done. Our next step was engaging community support, and as I suspect it might be the case, there have been a lot of people that support this project. Um, as you can see, um, you can see our Walker support buttons, uh, our stickers. Would you guys mind standing up, everybody who's here to support um, a playground for Walker? For, for, <laughs> thank you. For Thursday night during dinner time, I think that's a pretty good turnout, especially for our young people that spoke. That was just, um, it's, I'm glad that they were here. Off the top, I would like to recognize two people who were crucial to getting this project off the ground. Of course, Dr. Hastings and also board member uh, Juan Wade. Both provided guidance from the very beginning without which we would not be here. So before it was something that people were already talking about and was cool, a fun project. Um, Juan and Adam were having early morning meetings with me uh, to see if we could make this happen. So thank you. There are a lot of other uh, people to tell you about. I'm going to go through this next list here. Um, if we get the next slide, not just to say thank you, although I do want to do that, but I think that it's helpful to understand how we're engaging different contributions from our community that's going to make sure that this project is a success. As uh, Dr. Hastings mentioned, the parents of Walker Buford PTO support this initiative. Wild Rock is our nonprofit sponsor, which allows all donations to a playground for Walker to be tax deductible. Their executive director, Carolyn Schuyler, has years of experience researching and observing how students interact with the physical world around them and how those interactions support their growth and can help them process difficult emotions and experiences, including trauma. Carolyn has advised on the initiative and will continue to do so. This summer, Building Goodness Foundation hosted a design session with us and the American Institute of Architects, Central Virginia Emerging Professionals. The Emerging Professionals is a group of art architects who donate their time and talent to charitable causes. Dr. Hastings and Lisa Larson Torres also attended the session in support, and the architects created initial designs that we are using as a starting point for what might be possible in the Walker space. The group is led by Sean Mulligan, who is here tonight. He is a project architect with VMDO, and Sean has continued advising on this project, and he and several of his VMDO colleagues have committed to donating their skills to building the playground. We have several community funders. We have won grants from the Bama Works Fund and the Charlottesville Area Community Foundation, and we got that UVA Health System grant that started this in the first place. We have also, oh, and we have some support from individual philanthropists as well. We've also been working very closely with the Parks and Recreation Department. Um, I, I felt sorry uh, for Todd that he has the flu and also that he couldn't be here. We did include, we uploaded to the agenda a statement of support um, from the Parks and Recreation Department so you can kind of see what they would say if, if they were here. And I want to pause here and just say for the record that working with Parks and Rec has been um, what local government should be. Uh, they have been very responsive, they've listened, and just in general, I just got the sense that they're really here to serve the public. And I cannot say thank you enough to Todd Brown and Chris uh, Jensik and the other members of the Parks and Rec uh, Recreation Department. One of the valuable things that they've done is help us think about what we can do with the playground once the pending school reconfiguration happens and Walker is a preschool center. What we hope to do is purchase equipment that could be moved either to another CCS site or to a public uh, housing neighborhood. The latter is an idea that Parks and Rec came up with, and I love it because it means that young people will be able to enjoy this playground for many years to come. Parks and Rec did a site visit at Walker with Principal Hastings and our group, and we've identified the best site for the playground. And then we can get that next slide. It will be at the end of the soccer field that is closest to the school. So this first um, slide is a picture of where it is in relation to the other part of the school. And in the next slide, you can see the actual ground where the playground will be. 
And then in the next slide, you can see where, uh, where the playground would be in relation to the rest of the soccer field. Uh, one of the ideas that we have, we'll probably also put some park benches um, along. You can, the soccer goals are in this picture. They, they're hard to see. Um, but we would put some park benches to differentiate between where the soccer field is and then where the playground would be, which will also be nice for students to use and for the neighborhood to use when they come to watch soccer games on the weekends. We want to have the playground built this summer, and it is a realistic goal. Uh, on the next slide, you can see our steps for that. After we hopefully get your approval tonight, we're going to seek approval from the city council. It was not easy to find out for sure who owns the land that we would be building on, but Director Brown has confirmed that it is the city. So the city would be approving um, that Parks and Rec would also be responsible for the maintenance of the Walker Playground, as they are for other CCS and city playgrounds. Don't think this will be an issue because it's going to be new equipment. There's not going to be much maintenance costs uh, for the first few years at least. At the same time, we're going to work with Parks and Rec and our volunteer architects to create playground design options that will be presented at a forum that we will host in March in cooperation with Parks and Rec to engage community feedback. Then we'll create the final plans and purchase the equipment from vendors. If funds allow, we're also going to create an uh, outdoor classroom space, which is something that Dr. Hastings and teachers have requested, and we'll be doing that in line with the rest of this process. Then this summer, we'll be build the playground. We're applying to Building Goodness Foundation, and if they accept their proposal, the, our proposal, their volunteer builders will donate their time for installation. Again, a huge thank you to the Charlottesville community for supporting this initiative and to the board for considering our proposal. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, uh, Ms. Bennett, for your energy and your presentation. Um, really appreciate it. It's been it's a really long road and I know that you have been working tirelessly and I appreciate your um, your time and I'm excited that you've come so far so thank you um, does anybody have any comments or questions for Miss Bennett so you have really made us Sh like be quiet that's amazing <laughs> you've left us speechless <laughs> well, don't, don't speak too fast <laughs> oh you had your minute <laughs> no I just want to add in that you know it just seems something that was so obvious that we didn't have and once you know the community found out about it you know support started coming in so I just want to thank you for just bringing it to the community's uh, attention so I, I think let's give Miss Bennett a round of applause okay So our, our schools are usually very busy and some either with classes or getting work done on it. So it'll be some extra work here at Walker this summer with this going on. So it'll be exciting for the young students that talk that is very well maybe some playgrounds for you to come to next year from Berlin Moran for all the elementary schools. So great. That is great. I'd like to make a motion um, that uh, Charlottesville City School Board uh, approves the um, project to build a playground at Walker Upper Elementary School. That's Brian Brian's seconds. Thank you. Um, are there any, is there any discussion? Okay. All those in favor of school board, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Oh. Yes. <laughs> let's just be clear that the work has been endless and tireless I mean I feel like this process has been is like pretty truncated and does not honor all of the effort that has gone on beforehand and maybe that is because you've done work so hard is that there this process has been so short um, because you have done all of the work to make sure that you have the community support and the funding and it just makes it a really easy decision so um, thank you and congratulations okay so now we're going to have a literacy update just changing gears a little bit um, Ms. Tatel you're gonna drive for me Okay, I'll give you a little signal. Okay. Madam Chair, members of the board, Mr. Henderson, I'm excited to have been on the job for five weeks and share some division literacy updates. 
At this time of year, from pre-K all the way through 12th grade, teachers are analyzing their literacy data, such as PALS, PAT, MAP, and TERM data with a specific focus on academic growth among African American students, students with disabilities, and economically disadvantaged students. In response to this data, teachers are planning for strategic alterations to their Tier 1 instruction and revising tiered interventions for students who need additional support. One of the ways we responded in the fall to our student data was to improve our lesson plan aligning, uh, alignment and practice with the support of the curriculum design team. The current iteration of this team since January consists of a group of 20 teachers, reading specialists, and instructional coaches who are applying their lesson design skills to our new K-5 reading program. We are working toward two goals on this team. One, developing a full understanding of the program's K through two foundational skills in phonological awareness, oral language, and phonics. And two, aligning the core content to specific standards, learning targets, and formative assessments. As a result, we will have a cohort of teachers, specialists, and instructional coaches who are knowledgeable about the resource and who can champion it in their schools. We will also have a draft of revised pacing guides and a guidance document that will outline a cohesive and responsive implementation of the resource. Having a common resource will help us provide equitable learning opportunities to every student. Our pilot schools are working every day to improve their implementation of the HMH into reading program. I was fortunate to spend a day at all three schools watching the teachers plan or teach in, uh, teach or plan for instruction with the program. The other four schools all have the materials and over the course of the spring will do a soft opening in which they can try out some lessons in units. In fact, some, some grade level teams at non-pilot schools are already using the HMH into reading for their shared reading and foundational skills. Over the course of the spring and summer, we will plan for a cohesive and responsive full implementation for the fall. This means three things. One, guidance to teachers and principals on the non-negotiable elements of the program, revised pacing and assessments, and ongoing actionable professional learning supported by boots on the ground coaching. We are also looking to bring equitable access to high quality curriculum for our middle school students. We are reviewing the current process for program selection that was begun last year. But we are screening with two additional and important criteria. One is Ed Reports, an independent nonprofit that reviews educational resources. I've put the links up there for you. And the other is guidance on three important shifts that are best practices for reading instruction and fostering equitable outcomes for students. These three shifts include making sure that every student has access to grade level complex texts, building knowledge of science and social studies and other content areas, and teaching students to use evidence in oral and written response to text. These shifts are all practices that lay important groundwork for the unleveling initiative the high school has been committed to. I'm in the process of collaborating with the 6th through 8th grade teams to have them review the criteria and apply these to curriculum choices, including the one that they reviewed last year. We intend to submit a final proposal by May with plans for fall implementation. An update from grades 9 through 12. First and foremost, the high school continues to work on our unleveling initiative. In addition, broadening student access to high interest nonfiction text through the Newzella platform, developing vocabulary, peer, write, peer support in writing, integration of literacy and U.S. His, history content and instruction, real life skills development, and continued professional learning in PLCs on teaching, reading, and writing without tracking students. Speaking of professional learning, our teachers appreciate meaningful professional learning that will improve their student outcomes. To that end, we are piloting a course for the division that could be a literacy version of our Number and Number Sense course. We're using the Reading 101 modules on the Reading Rocket website. A cohort of 35 teachers and coaches pre-K through 12 have volunteered for this pilot course to help us design future professional learning for our teachers and leaders. We meet monthly and use the Canvas platform for accountability and discourse throughout the week. I want to make sure that we really appreciate the effort of this cohort of teachers that are making outside their workday to improve their practice and support professional learning for other teachers. This group is very engaged in their learning, and there is a high level of curiosity and drive to learn about and implement literacy instruction that is based on the science of reading. In other professional learning news, a small group of us were fortunate to attend the Plain Talk About Literacy and Learning Conference last week in New Orleans. 
This group included Gertrude Ivory, Sheila Sparks, our pre-K coordinator, Anna Isley, principal of Clark, Adam Hastings, principal of Walker, Sita Delorier, principal of Buf assistant principal of Buford, and myself. We steeped ourselves in the research on best practices for liter literacy instruction that foster equitable outcomes for every student. These will sound familiar to you because they undergird the literacy work we are doing and getting ready to do across the division with our new resources. One is to teach foundational skills in pre-K through second grade. This means phonological awareness, oral language, and phonics. Two is to teach with complex text at, grade, at tier one to give every student access to grade level material. Three is to teach students to use evidence from the text in oral and written response. Four is to build knowledge by using meaningfully designed units of study related to social studies and science instead of skills in isolation. Another one is to ensure a plan for students who need additional support without strong, uh, even with strong tier one, and of course, as usual, high quality pre-K. And lastly, here's what I've been up to in, my, my last, in the last five weeks. I've been visiting classrooms and principals across the division so I can learn how to support our teachers and leaders. I've been leading professional learning for our reading specialists, which included reading and responding to the Emily Hanford article from American Public Media, which I've linked here for you as well, that came out this fall. And as a result, our reading specialists have already taken some immediate actions and have also helped to begin drafting a mission framework for literacy instruction and learning in the division. And I've been collaborating with other coordinators um, and drafting a VTS guidance, VTSS guidance tool for literacy. So in closing, you can go to the next slide. Um, your support is critical, and I'd like to underscore two major components of improving our literacy outcomes for every student. Um, high quality instructional resources and professional learning that includes literacy coaches who have specific content knowledge and who can support ongoing actionable professional learning for teachers and leaders on cohesive implementation of curriculum and pedagogy. I thank you for support, your support and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. And I actually have a question already here. <laughs> Can I go ahead and answer that? That's amazing. Yes, so why don't you go ahead and start with that one. Okay. This is a question from um, Ms. Bryson Morsberger. Thank you. Um, she asked about data regarding the student performance during the pilot program. And um, my answer is that we are looking at that data. Our data meetings have not happened yet, and we will have that data at the end of the year. Um, we have done quarterly meetings in the past, Mr. Henderson. Is there any way that we can get that data, get some information quarterly about where our children are? Again, Ms. Tatel, I know that you've only been here five weeks, so I apologize. Um, okay. We actually have not started our data meetings, and we're beginning them um, actually in a few weeks. And so we will be reporting out, and then we can bring that back to you soon after. Any other? OK, so um, back to the questions. Ms. Perrier. Um, Ms. Tatel, on uh, your slide that deals with the literacy program selection, I uh, looked at both of the links, one for ed reports and one for course shifts. I was wondering if those were um, things that you and your reading team selected. Uh, is it a companion to the reading program that we currently have? And if these are, if, if these are companion um, tools, I understand that. If they are not, how did you make a decision to select those? I i.e. Ed Reports and Core Shifts. Ed Reports is an independent nonprofit. Um, I think it's important that we have some criteria that are outside of the criteria that the commercial program provides for us. Um, and Ed Reports is one of the top resources out there to, to do some very initial vetting of programs, not just literacy, but if you look at it, it's got math and science and social studies. It's a national nationally renowned program. Um, and the course shifts um, document comes from uh, student achievement partners. Um, and uh, they've been doing some of the most sort of innovative work around literacy instruction and creating equitable outcomes for all students. Dr. Kraft. Yes. Um, thank you for all of this. By the way, you've been pretty busy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So um, I'm wondering for the layperson, such as me, um, I'm wondering if you could just um, say a little bit about what, what are the main changes uh, f 
with what you're what you're uh, proposing and planning from the way we've been doing things. What what's different here? At the elementary level, we um, we have a lot of growth to do in terms of all being on the same page, um, in terms of what we are teaching. Teachers spend a lot of time. We want teachers to spend their time talking about how they're going to teach and then analyzing how their students have responded, but without a high quality program that meets, that, that addresses all the areas of literacy, they're having to do a lot of that legwork of creating curriculum. So having these resources will allow teachers to do the work of the intellectual preparation of how am I going to teach this to my students, how am I going to scaffold this for my students, and then analyzing how their students responded. So they'll be spending less time creating material and more time using high quality vetted material to teach. So it's consistency um, across teachers in being able to teach what we're really wanting them to yes. teach. Yes, and consistency across classrooms, across grade levels, across schools. So it won't matter whether your child, whatever child you go, whatever school your child goes to in the Charlottesville City Schools, they're going to have access to the same high quality instruction. Are there changes in the approach to literacy or the approach to reading um, with this new system? I think this new system is going to help us um, refocus and recommit to some of those key things, such as non-negotiables around phonological awareness, oral language, and phonics instruction that um, reflects the science of reading. And, um, and the other, I think, big thing that, that we are going to be more consistent around is ensuring that every student, regardless of where they are with their reading, has access to grade level text. Okay. And so they're continuing to accelerate their achievement. Great. Thanks. Ms. Bryson Morsbarker, do you have any? You're good for that. Mr. Bryant? So with this. <laughs> Thank you. So with this new literacy program, <clears throat> Excuse my voice. Um, will it continue to level the playing field for all children? That is the idea. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we will be seeing those results eventually. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's the idea. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. You. We wouldn't be doing this if we didn't think we'd be seeing results. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I, I had a Mr. Wayne. So, um, Stephanie, you've kind of been, you know, kind of in the trenches for many years, and now you have the pr perspective of looking at the whole system, and you've been doing it about five um, weeks now, and I know that we've talked on many occasion occasions, and, and you and others are not afraid to share your thoughts. And now that you're kind of, you know, have an ability to affect change in this, and you see this, you have, you've had five weeks, you've talked with your colleagues. Um, what's, what's kind of your, your gut feeling on how things are, are going as you talk to the teachers about this new approach? Mm -hmm. My sense is that teachers and principals alike are hungry for consistency, they're ready for clarity, and they will do anything to um, improve their outcomes for every student and to foster equity in their schools. Teachers, um, I was at Greenbrier today meeting with, the, um, with, with their instructional team and the consensus I get from teachers is we're, we're ready, we want it, we, we want the consistency, we want to all be on the same page, we want to make sure we're, we're doing best practices and, and, and they want support to do that. So one of the things that I have been told and I've actually witnessed because I, I mentor some youth in the community is that, you know, as far as the literacy is that when students come into the school system, when we get them at sometimes three, four, kindergarten or first grade, whatever, is that some of our students um, come in with just a vast background because They've had opportunities um, to travel, to, to read, or, or what have you. And other students, they had those not as many opportunities. 
Um, is that something that you witness and would that have an impact on the literacy? You're absolutely right that our students come to us with all levels of preparation um, from our two-year-olds in early intervention or three-year-olds in intervention all the way to our 12th graders who might show up in the middle of the year and have had interrupted schooling. Um, so I think number one, that's a reality for any teacher at any grade level. Um, that and uh, the, the reality is that we have to meet our students where they are and we have to work within what we can control. And these, these resources and professional learning are things that we can control within our school division. And so the, that's why they're so important. Um, I think our pre-K pro program is doing a lot to help with, with preparation as well. And then I think the other part is we just also have to have the, the highest of expectations for every student and every family, regardless of what, how they come to us, that we're going to do what we can to, to, to help them move along. Uh, you know, I like what you said about regardless of, ha of having the highest expectation, regardless of your background. I, th I think that that's, that's vital. Um, Shirley Lee and I, we had the opportunity um, a couple of days ago of advocating for services for um, our students to um, Senators Kane and Warner's um, aides because they were busy with the impeachment things. Um, and we shared that as well as with um, Representative um, Rickleman. And um, one of the things that we mentioned to them is that so many things that we have to, as teachers, deal with students before we can be begin to educate them. In this community, unfortunately, there's been a lot of trauma with what happened a few years ago, and just ongoing trauma with, you know, with the what may be going on in in the community or their homes. Um, can you speak to that? Where that might have impact on the literacy or the ability to. Um, teach the, the student? Um, I think, um, I'm thinking about my answer to that question. Um, our, our students are people first, absolutely. We have to, and uh, teachers have the, have the hardest job um, because they are trying to both accelerate academics and sort of feed the social emotional level of, of their students. Um, but I also do really believe and I think there's research to back this up that um, if we that we can address both social emotional needs and academics at the same time and I think one of the powerful pieces of some of these resources is, are that they the 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 text and the literature the the units are designed meaningfully they're um, they're uh, couched in science and social kids, kids find them interesting and engaging and they also amplify diverse voices all the literature in all these programs has um, a representation of diverse voices that represents our student body and so I, I think that kids um, while, while some kids are going to come to us with trauma I think I, th I think and I think our, our teachers believe we can still engage them in learning Thank you. I appreciate it. I know I didn't give you the heads up on those questions, and I <laughs> wasn't okay. trying to get at that you. That would have been unfair. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. McKeever. Um, I want to make sure I pronounce it correctly. Is it Tatel? Yes. Is that right? Um, Ms. Tatel, as we all know, um, reading is the foundation for everything, because no matter what we do, at some point you are going to have to read. So I guess, hence the slogan, reading is fundamental. <laughs> Um, we hear people speaking all the time about on grade level and for different people in the room whether you're in the room or listening or watching that means different things to different people one of the things that I would be interested in seeing if you and Mrs. Ivory could pull it together because she's been here from the beginning of our three and four year old program. Mm -hmm. I would like to see how our students, Mrs. Ivory, that started with us back in the day in the three and four year old program, how are they doing, A, with their reading and how do we see them adapting to this particular new reading program because we're saying that this is going to assist uh, the students from all 
all backgrounds because we accept everyone for where they are. Uh, there is a certain degree of diversity in the readings and I'm wanting to I hear you saying that these things are going to engage the students. So I'm just trying to see how we gauge that uh, with the earlier grades because you showed us the information for a sixth through eighth grade and I did open that up and read it. Uh, so I'm just wondering how, Let me make sure I understand your how question. that happens. You're wanting to know our students who joined us as three and four year olds, mm -hmm. how are they faring now? Yes. Okay. And how, in addition to that, our new three and four year olds, how that, because the ones that we had, um, Mrs. Ivory from the three and four year olds were in the old reading program, but now they're doing this. So seeing how that's working and what differences and impacts with our new three and four year olds we're going to have with the new reading program. Yes, uh, Mrs. Perrier, we'll be happy to give you that information. We'll track our students. I know we used to do that on a regular basis, mm -hmm. look at those, yeah. that cohort of students and mm -hmm. how they matriculated through our school division. I do have to say that this year in particular, mm -hmm. congratulations to Ms. Sheila Sparks, which is one of the reasons she came to the Literacy Conference. She has instituted a literacy curriculum, literacy and math curriculum, for our preschool students. Okay. So we're definitely going to see additional support and gains in those students just because of the focus and the attention okay. with all the preschools having a consistent program. The same kind of thing we're trying to do across our elementary schools. Okay. So she has already started that. Okay. So we'll be happy to give you that information. Thanks. I mean, I frankly would like to see all of the data that we used to track on a quarterly basis very soon. Not just the data meetings analysis, but like who's in which um, tier we talked about there's three tiers who's you know and and how are we moving them along um, and I, I just feel like I appreciate Ms. Tatel's presentation and I think it's it sounds like all of this great work is going into Christian professional development or schools um, but I know that um, we have a very specific um, focus on ensuring outcomes for our um, uh, for all of our students, and I just we just need to see data. Okay. Um, so if we could get that data sooner rather than later, that'd be great. I had one more question. Yes, Ms. Oh, do you want to go first? Um, I wanted to um, um, focus a little bit on the literacy coaches. Um, these are new positions, and. Um, just uh, wanting to. I don't to know that this is a. I think we can talk about that during the budget presentation. I don't know. Miss Tatel's not. Necessarily. Well, I want to understand what they are, what how they fit into the picture here, and just understanding what the scope of like a literacy coach, what their workload would be. You know, in other words, how many resources in this area might we need to uh, accomplish what you want to accomplish? Are you asking her like what can we do to support you? Yeah. Yeah, and I'm just wanting to understand how they fit. It seems like they are a critical piece of the system that we're trying to put into place mm -hmm. here. And I want to make sure that we are adequately supporting um, your efforts here. And so I'm just trying to understand it since they're new. Yeah. I think I cannot emphasize enough the role that professional learning plays for teachers and the impact that that has on improving student outcomes. So we cannot just hand teachers a program and expect improvement. We have to support teachers with that. To that end, literacy coaches would bring not only coaching support, but also specific content knowledge about all the levels of, of literacy learning. They could be in the buildings strategically supporting teachers to learn all the different components of the program um, and, and implement them well. Often what happens with, um, and this is in general, not just Charlottesville City Schools, but teachers are handed a program and expected to just implement it. And we have a range, we have teachers coming straight out of 
the university. We have teachers who are career changers. We have teachers who are switching grade levels. Even the challenge of switching from one school to another is huge. Um, the sort of innovation overload for a teacher is tremendous. And so I just, I can't, un I can't un uh, emphasize enough the need for direct support for teachers in the, especially as we're beginning this implementation. Yeah, thank you. Ms. Bryson Morseberger. Last question, I promise. Um, with the request that uh, Ms. Perrier made about the co cohort of preschoolers, mm -hmm. can we also see, you mentioned earlier about additional supports from the conference, like what additional supports look like for students? And if you could just add in for our schools, like what are the additional supports we're providing right now and how it compares to the conference or like if we need improvements in that area, where are they needed? So let me just make sure I understand. You want to know what additional supports we currently have in our schools for students who are struggling? Yeah, and then in reference to, you were saying at the conference when they were outlining the things you need for equitable outcomes, oh. it talked about additional supports and just like what they look like and if we're on track with what, you know, is lining up with equitable outcomes. Sure. That's it. Do any other board members have any comments or questions? Okay, thank you, Ms. Tatel, and um, thank you for taking time to <laughs> stop here. And I'm sure you have a lot of other things to do, so thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay, um, the next item on our agenda is presentation of the 2020-2021 budget. Um, again, I just want to clarify a couple things. One is um, Ms. Torres is with Dr. Atkins and Kim Powell at the city um, city work session, um, budget work session, um, and to answer any questions that the city council might have of us um, related to this budget presentation. So that's why Ms. Ivory is going to be presenting the budget um, today. So thank you for coming and stepping in. Thank you. Good evening again, Madam Chair, members of the board, Mr. Henderson, and all here assembled. It is my pleasure and privilege this evening to present the fiscal year 2021 Charlottesville City Schools budget. We are going to talk about our focus and priorities, our requests, a summary, next steps, and wrap up. And you do have additional documentation about enrollment in your packet. The budget process included requests from other budget holders. Okay, maybe that slide's not in there. That's okay. <laughs> We review, we look at what the budget holders are requesting, um, we look at how that aligns with our priorities, and then we actually funnel those into the requests that we will advance to the school board for approval. So we had over 50 plus requests to be considered, totaling over $4 million, and 16 of those were advanced to, proposal to, uh, uh, to the proposal, totaling $1 million. So our budget, uh, one of the biggest drivers for our budget is our strategic plan. But I want you to bear in mind the two young people you saw up here tonight who came to talk about the Walker Playground and the three young men you saw tonight who came to talk about M3, MP3. We need to always think about the needs of our students when we are looking at our budget. They are why we are here. And so our strategic plan helps us to focus on that. Of course, the three areas, academic excellence, safe and supportive schools, and organizational supports. There are only two kinds of people in schools, students and those who support students. And so we need to be sure that we are doing what we can to advance um, the supports for our students. We, we should do all of that through an equity lens, and that's why we have our equity goals listed there, diverse, inclusive, and rigorous learning experiences, which ties nicely to our academic excellence, growing relationships, safe and supportive schools, and supported uh, staff, the organizational supports that we have, and then the equity foundations to make sure that what we do is aligned with best practices and um, steering us in the appropriate direction to respond to the needs of our students. So we've taken each of our budget issues and aligned those with the strategic plan. I won't go through each of those. We will talk about them, but in a different way. But I, they are lined up here 
according to the strategic plan. So these items relate to academic excellence. The next group of items relate to safe and supportive schools. And the last group of items relate to organizational supports and supported and supportive staff. And then um, the next slide shows a summary of those three areas, how much we're asking in each of those categories related to our strategic plan and equity goals. All right. So as a reminder, in 2014, the Blue Ribbon Commission said that to keep our, um, in order for us to maintain and be sustainable at the level we, we need to be with growing costs and changes in what is going on, that we would have between a two and four million dollar gap. And I would think that if um, they were to do that today, it would be even higher. So our budget request is in line with the projections about what should happen going forward if you're going to have a sustainable budget. The priorities that are driving our budget, of course, again, I'm going to say the needs of our students, they are why we're here, advancing our strategic objectives um, and equity goals, competitive and compensation and benefits, and maintaining valued and required programs and supports. So a recap of our budget request. And on this form, the strategic plan reference is just outlined by number, and the items are grouped by category. So the salary actions are to um, increase our teacher pay by a step plus one and three quarters percent, an average of three percent increase. Move support staff up plus, uh, one step plus two percent for an average of three percent, and move administrative staff up one plus one and a quarter percent, uh, three quarters percent with an average of a three percent increase. Our non-discretionary contracts, we don't have much control over those. Uh, those are the areas that we, in order for us to just maintain the work that we do, we have to have those. I don't think any of those need to be explained. Um, the telecommunications one in particular has to do with the reduction in the E-rate. And then the additional requests on the next page are actually from the budget holders. Next page, please. Thank you. Right. Um, and I will outline each of those. These are school-based and program supports that have been requested by budget holders and principals. Um, art supplies, because we have increased enrollment in art in our, our schools, we need additional supplies. To move our math instructional leaders to a 210 day, they generally work extra days anyway, so moving them uh, would save us money in that arena, but we would also have those people available to us to do the work that needs to be done. We will continue our work, as Ms. Tato said, around standards aligned lesson planning in literacy and social studies in particular, but also in the other content areas where it's needed. Uh, we want to increase the pay, the substitute pay for nutrition custodian and secretarial subs from $9.75 to $12 an hour. We want to increase the substitute teacher pay rate from $91 a day to $105 a day. We want to add, because the enrollment of our English language learners has increased, we need to add a, an English learner teacher. English, English language learner teacher. We'd like to add an iSTEM teacher. Our goal is to have uh, full-time iSTEM teachers in all of our schools um, as we go forward. This would give us an additional one and we would um, down the road request another. Uh, asking for division, division literacy coaches for elementary and secondary and I think you've had the explanation about that from Ms. Tatum. Uh, professional development in the world languages. We want to revamp our world languages program to be um, in line with where world languages are going. We want a proficiency oriented uh, program and not just uh, learning isolated facts or is isolated vocabulary. We want our students to be able to communicate in those languages. So we need some professional learning for our teachers to revamp the curriculum and revamp our program. Because of increased enrollment, we're asking for an additional orchestra teacher at Walker. 
Uh, we're asking to add instrument repair and maintenance funds. Uh, because students are advancing from Walker uh, to Buford in the engineering program, we want to add an additional engineering teacher at Buford Middle School. And we're requesting a, a high, um, P PE teacher for CHS because of our English language learners who need to have an elective and we need to have that um, physical education teacher available so that those students can be provided that. And to assist us with um, securing additional funds for specific programs in our school division, we are requesting to add a specialist for annual giving who would coordinate and solicit funding for specific programs, including preschool, but other programs in the division as well. And then Buford, uh, we are requesting a student support uh, assistant to help out at Buford Middle School. And we had some teacher input. Several teachers um, were on a committee. And we've had three meetings with those teachers to discuss how we can incentivize um, teachers who serve as substitutes. So we have come up with a plan for that. And we're requesting money to do that. All those requests total $1 million. $27,098. So if, and then if we go to the next page, um, school operations requests, um, these are in the technology arena, the first two, and these are our response um, to be sure that our infrastructure in the technology arena is protected uh, with cyber, uh, from cyber threats. And because the cost of responding to a breach would be much more than paying for, it's sort of like insurance to some degree, because um, if we had to pay for a breach, the, the cost to us financially as well as in the, um, the critical operations, what would happen to our critical operations could be tremendous. So we think that's a worthwhile investment. Other reductions, uh, because of enrollment, we will be reducing 4.5 teachers and one instructional assistant. And then the revenue side of that, the expected revenue from the state and the federal, and that federal re re uh, reflects a reduction over time to bring the budget into alignment with what we have actually been getting from the federal government. So our request to the city will be 4. Uh, four million five hundred twenty thousand three hundred fifty dollars and our next steps as far as the budget goes is our meeting tonight of course and then there's a budget work session on February 11th at four o'clock at K Tech auditorium the school board meeting for hopefully approval of the superintendent's budget on February 20th at 5 p.m. here at the media center Presentation of our approved budget to City Council on Monday, March 2nd at 6.30 p.m. And then City Council adoption of the 2021 budget, April 14th at 5.30 p.m. The additional information in your packet is, uh, in the appendix, is about enrollment. So if you have any questions about any of the budget information, um, I'd be happy to, the best of my ability, to respond to that. Okay, I just want to say thank you to um, Ms. Ivory for pinch hitting here this evening. I also want to say um, that the school board has seen these numbers a lot um, over the past several weeks, so I appreciate that. But also, um, Ms. Perrier, you had a question or um, comment. It's just a minor detail. I yes. noticed it when we had our uh, meeting with City Council. We're doing a recap. Um, and this is me being petty betty, mm -hmm. but trying to make things easier for people to read. You're talking about your CHSPE teacher. I think, high there, school. I think there needs to be a space between the S and the P because it's CHSPE and people are like, what is okay. CHSPE? The, so, it is on mine, but maybe it's not on your yeah, So I think okay. yeah, on the slide it needs to have that right. little yes, space to make it okay. more. Make it clearer. Yes, ma'am. I also want to say that at the work session next week, we're going to have a, um, I think Dr. Atkins is going to present a proposal regarding substitute teachers for the rest of the year. Yes. Just for your information, that we're, that's going to be on the agenda for next week's work session. Um, moreover, I just want to highlight that we have hired on this um, personnel report, 11 new substitutes. Yes. So that seems like a total of 18 over the past two months. Excellent. That we've and and the schools have reported 
uh, two things. We've had some conversation with the TAC committee and with teachers who are on that substitute committee about looking inward as well, because it's not just an outside problem. So I think teachers have, re uh, principals have reported that attendance has been better. Maybe we're through the flu season, uh, you know, for most people, so maybe that's helping. But um, also, yes, it, and, and putting in those incentives on the other side. I think that's going to help us as well. Um, I remember Dr. Turner told me day before yesterday, that he uh, congratulated his teachers because there were two weeks where they only had one substitute a day in the building. So that was a really wonderful um, yeah, piece of data. <laughs> yes. Dr. Kraft? Um, yes, um, and thank you. Thank you for your presentation. And we have seen seen the numbers, sometimes it takes a little while to sort of realize what's not there. Um, and so there's something that I wanted to ask about in that regard, which I'll also bring up at our work session. Um, and uh, that is um, regarding the preschool program. Um, it, it seems to me that we have, uh, and Ms. Sparks is uh, tasked with coordinating that program on a half-time basis in addition to her other, <coughs> other responsibilities. And um, with all of the implementation of new curricula uh, and the social-emotional um, learning that's been going on, and also I'm assuming she would be involved in the development of the new Early Childhood Education Center, it seems to me that that perhaps her position should be increased, the um, preschool director coordinator's role, and I'm wondering if that was, anyway, where that is. So I'm, I'm aware that uh, it seems like there's a need there that isn't reflected in our budget. Absolutely. I, I think that may have been one of the requests. We always prioritize the requests, and um, I'll have to check, but I'm sure Dr. Atkins will be able to respond to that. Uh, we'll make sure we get you a response. Okay, thanks. Ms. Bryson Morrisberger also had a question that um, regarding the totals, which I thought was a good question that I wanted to make sure. I, I hope you had, I had asked specifically that that be something that you were able to see beforehand. Was that something you were able the to see? The totals for? The contracts, they, we it said the, the difference, what we present is the difference from last year. And so, like under the contracts, is that the, I, I don't mean to put words in your mouth. They, that was the question, and uh, they responded by email. Okay. The actual, okay, we did it today, yes. 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 And the question for everyone was, I was confused when you're looking at the budget uh, for the city contracts, mm -hmm. that it's not the total cost, it's just the right. increase. The additional. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to see what the total number looked like that, um, the, you know, this, with the school contracts between the city. Right. Um, any other questions uh, from oh, Ms. this side of the dais? Mr. Bryant? Okay. Mr. Wade? Yes. Um, uh, I just want to make a comment really for the, the, the public. We've went over, gone over these numbers several times. Um, Leslie, if you can go to the recap um, page. Oh, this one here. <laughs> you, you're quick. Yes. <laughs> so, so I just want to note the, the amount of money that of the increase that's really, we don't have any control over, really $2.5 million. And I would venture to say that I think that if we want to keep and maintain teachers, that um, the top three are, you know, almost non-discretionary as well. And and so even though it may, where we are asking for nearly $5 million more million, most of that are things that are out of our, our control. We have to stay competitive to get High quali highly qualified teachers and things like health insurance and VRS we don't have any control over. And again, this is in line with what the um, study said, you know, several years ago. It said, you know, this, these are, if we want to maintain what we're doing, um, and I will venture to say we want to go above and beyond that. We want to, again, a system that thrives and want to be able to offer new programs, new initiatives, and um, and, and so we'll be working with city council. I I'm, imagine that's what Rosa and Lisa are doing right now, you know, um, talking about these various programs and, and why we're asking for additional funds. So that's thank right. you. 
I, I think it's really important to note that this um, budget that the superintendent is proposing highlights um, two really strong uh, priorities of this school board. One is maintaining a quality workforce, which you highlighted as well. Um, it, again, a 3% raise on average is, uh, is uh, really not what I would want to do for our teachers and our staff who w go above and beyond every day, but uh, is a starting place and certainly something that I think we should be able to give to our uh, very hardworking staff. Uh, additionally, I think this prioritizes literacy in a way that we as a school board and we as a community are demanding. So uh, I appreciate the school superintendent's focus on those um, two areas and both of those areas she's looking through this budget with the equity lens Absolutely. which is just critical um, and I think in order to maintain the current quality of programming that we have around our fine arts around our um, um, engineering yeah engineering <laughs> um, our summer school like we have a, a lot of quality programs that um, are maintained in this budget, mm -hmm. which is a huge priority of this school board as well. Um, so I think it's really vital that um, we continue to uh, ask our city council to fund our full request um, and of course ask the state for additional money. But again, any, any monies that's coming through the state is really washed and folded and like we get a small percentage of that is <laughs> it is not nearly um, what it looks to be when you're first um, looking at the state numbers because again our LCI uh, our local comp composite index went up so the state um, contribution to our locality has decreased so uh, that is why we routinely uh, request between two and five million dollars extra every year um, of the City Council. That is certainly what the Blue Ribbon Commission suggested would happen and is literally on task, on target. And in order to maintain our current programming and to improve our literacy outcomes and to ma ma maintain the workforce that we have, since we are, are very demanding uh, of our staff, I believe that we need to support this budget and our community needs to support this budget. Um, so uh, thank you very much. That's all I have to all say. All right. Thank you, Ms. McKeever. Definitely um, my mantra, school improvement lies in people improvement. And so professional learning is key. And literacy is at the heart of what we do. And when we look at everything through an equity lens, we can't help but come out on the right side, yes. headed in the right direction. Is there thank any you. other comments or questions for Ms. Ivory? Okay. Right. Appreciate you stepping in. Thank you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, let's see. Mr. Henderson, what is currently up is superintendent's comments. Do you have any? I do not, except for... Um, oh, wait, Dr. Uh, I'm so confused. No, it's <laughs> so are you? you can talk about Ms. Henderson might want to say something. We are a true team. <laughs> That's, That's right. what it is. All right. Oh, you're right. I was supposed to go to um, board member comments for it. Or comments from the... I just went though. I don't know. You can go have a seat, Ms. Ivory. Right. Go have a seat. I'll get you back in a minute. Right. Oh. <laughs> oh, man. Lord. Okay. So comments from members of the community is the next thing. So um, you have, we invite, we encourage members of the community to come and speak. Um, we, and we ask that you limit your comments to three minutes. Please state your name and your address. Mr. Myers? Oh, sorry about that. Uh, good volume. Okay, Chris Meyer, 124 Oakland Court. My son is at Jackson Valley, a first grader, uh, and a participant in class. A couple things on the on the budget. Uh, one, um, when the administration discusses hourly wages I, and benefits, I hope they start thinking about total compensation. We're seeing that insurance is going up a lot, and of course, some people receive insurance, health insurance. Some people don't, uh, but. It's a lot different when you're getting $15 an hour and health insurance and retirement benefits and it's when you're not. So I do hope you, we start to consider that as a whole package and, and discuss it uh, in that way. Uh, second, uh, 
I'm mean, wondering if the administration can find places to increase fees in a progressive manner. Uh, while a small amount, it does demonstrate that you're looking at the budget through an equity lens. Uh, the class program is an example and an opportunity, I think. Third, um, would also be, be, I'd like to understand better, you have operations budgets here, but what I'm not seeing is a lot of discussions around facilities. And we know that in the, uh, the capital improvement plan at the city, it's also talking about money for reconfiguration for the schools and what are actually happening uh, in our buildings and do we have enough money to do that. Uh, so looking at the depreciation schedules, for example, uh, we have a lot of old buildings. You know, are we getting the amount of money we need from the city to keep those fresh? Thank you. Second, uh, I'm excited to hear about the, the class programs, potential collaboration with YMCA. Anything that can get more people in there so we can service more students, I think is, is uh, very important, especially from an equity perspective. I would just hope that, again, we're focusing on a zero wait list outcome at the start of the school. That should be our goal. If the collaboration is not going to have a zero wait list outcome by the time we start the school system for everybody who registered by the end of the previous school year, then I would not consider it a success. Uh, second, or sorry, third overarching argument, there was an interesting study that just came out on active shooter drills. I don't know if people saw that, but I would hope the psych school counselors and psychologists review that because there is it looks like, at least according to the study, impacts on anxiety with students. Finally, um, I just uh, I did hear a comment from a board member at the last one after parent com conversations or comments, and I just that sometimes there's, I guess, the idea that these board members are not supposed to respond to what the parent comments have, and I would hope that actually the board members do respond. I think. Uh, LaShondra, sorry, Bryson Morger did a great job the last, and I, and I do encourage, uh, again, and would hope to hear those observations on what parents, uh, on parents' concerns, rather than, you might say, I'll, hearing about your list of the events you attended. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. Uh, just to clarify, um, I want the public to be very clear that um, in April there, pro there will be a um, registration opportunity for preschool, I mean, I'm sorry, for after school. And um, I really encourage um, parents to be on the lookout for flyers and information related to that. Um, the zero wait list outcome that Mr. Meyer has um, proposed is certainly a great, but we cannot possibly do that if we do not have the staff. And in order to have the staff, we need people to sign up as soon as possible. So please be on the lookout for information and sign up and follow what um, the process will be. We are going to be um, looking at this process in March and in April, no, in March and April, I believe, maybe February and March, um, so that the parents um, can have a very wide heads up about when this, um, when registration for after school for next year will happen. Um, so thank you for that prompt. Um, and uh, yes, so any other comments related to, yes, please come on up. State your name, address, whatever you want. Um, hi, I'm Becca Cole. I live in Brandywine Drive. And uh, I had no intention of making comments today, but your, your mentioning of the class registration process in May or in March um, reminded me of the process last year when I was registering my daughter for aftercare for the first time. Um, I don't know if this is citywide, but I think it probably is. We had to show up at the school during what is normally everyone's work day and line up for a process that I think ended up being more than an hour at Greenbrier. Um, and then it's at first come, first serve who shows up on that list. Well, again, that was last year. I just want to clarify. Well, that's, what I, that, that's my, my comment is I'm, I'm hoping that somebody has looked at that process because it did not make any sense to me then. It is certainly not equitable. And I really hope that we have a new system in place this year. Appreciate Ms. Nicole. Any other comments from the public at this time? Okay, so I think we have board member comments now. And so I'm going to start with Mr. Bryant. I certainly want to um, thank those who came before the board tonight to speak, uh, especially those concerns from the gentleman who spoke about 
the achievement gap and um, the young lady who spoke in um, regards to the Just Children program and those students feeling left behind. Also, I'd like to give kudos to Dr. Harris, who was actually my mentor when I entered the master's program at UVA, and um, Daniel for doing a great job in um, reinventing the wheel with um, the M MP3 program. Um, and also the, the children who came up and spoke about the Walker program. Walker is very special to me. I spent 22 years there teaching. So and I used to see the children running out on the, on the black top, falling and scratching and scraping arms and legs. So very happy that that playground has finally come to fruition. Um, I didn't do very much after um, since January, except um, I did attend a, a panel discussion um, that Dr. Atkins participated in. The, um, the Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated um, had their conference here in Charlottesville. And um, Dr. Atkins was a part of that, um, that um, panel discussion, which was very interesting on equity, led by Dr. Cameron Webb. Um, also, um, Sherry and I um, participated in the MLK concert, the annual concert each year, recognizing the achievements of Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, the choir sounded great, and the message was great, so we all had a great time. And also, I've uh, also attended along with several other board members, uh, the Virginia School Board Association Capital Conference, um, and we met with um, Senator Creed Deegs and representatives of Sally Hudson's um, staff. So the work continues. Um, the only comment I wanted to make was, um, as a new board member, I've been learning a lot about uh, the budget process. And um, one thing that was really surprising for me to learn is how much of our state fund or how much of our school funding is dependent on state funding and the governor's budget um, and what's approved at the state level. And so I just want to emphasize that when we're talking about these things, that there's a, a push going on right now, um, fund our schools, hashtag fund our schools, <laughs> and it's a push to get the state to fully fund our schools because uh, there was a big cut to education funding during um, and after the recession and we haven't gotten back up to state levels. So it's, it's usually, it's up to the localities to make it up. Um, and the city has, you know, made up that funding every year. Um, but I just want to push the members of the public, if it's important to you, to reach out um, to the legislature and to the governor um, to support this effort to fully fund our schools back to pre-recession levels to fully fund them with state funding. Well, this is a nice segue from that. Um, I, I had the privilege of attending um, two conferences just this past week and weekend. Um, the uh, NSB, National School Boards Association Equity Conference and then the Advocacy um, Institute, I guess they call it, and Federal Networking um, Relationships uh, effort. And um, both were really valuable. It's really um, important for school board members to do our own professional learning. Um, and I, I would say just briefly here, um, you know, the other place where that's supposed to be funding us is the federal government. And so this effort um, in the Advocacy Institute is focused on lobbying and advocating at the federal level with our United States senators and our congressmen to um, increase federal funding for various efforts that, you know, will help us with teacher recruitment and retention, will help us with infrastructure, and will help us with the costs of um, uh, educating all of our students with uh, disabilities. And it's, it's hard to keep up with things like that, like what's really going on in the federal government. And I know for me, I get <clears throat> kind of discouraged these days. Um, but it's, it is really important, and you never know what effort, you know, what effort is actually going to bear fruit. So I, I found it really valuable to, to sit there and do this and make our case. And I think it's important for them to hear um, from everybody in, the, in, in our communities about the needs of our public schools. 
and especially right now and especially in this, in this administration. I think it's very important to keep the pressure on. That's it. The committees that we serve on, um, the board members give overviews to in order that the people in the community know the things that are going on behind the scenes that keep our school division moving. Uh, when Dr. Kraft just spoke about monies as it relates to uh, Medicaid and uh, students with disabilities, we need to understand that the PrEP Board, which is the Piedmont Regional Education Program, was slated to have a funding formula change, which was going to cost all of the nine school divisions in the PrEP program an awful lot of money. It would have cost our school division somewhere between 500000 and a million dollars. Dr. Atkins, um, the other eight superintendents, and all of our members from our school board and other school boards in the region that are part of the PrEP program have been working diligently to ensure that that new formula does not come about and what we are currently doing for our Medicaid recipients and our special needs students um, maintains the same degree of services but is not costing uh, the divisions more because that is definitely not equitable. Uh, once again, the Public Education Foundation will sponsor our STEM camp uh, this summer at uh, UVA and we are getting lots of applications for that program. The information is out at um, all of the schools and it's for rising 7th and 8th graders. So we are fortunate to have students coming from both Walker and Buford to participate. One of the things that we have worked diligently on, tirelessly on, uh, has been our equity policy. And as a member of the National Steering Committee for CUBE, uh, while I was in Washington, we received kudos for our uh, equity policy, which is posted on our website. And many people, while we were there, looked at it, asked various and sundry questions, and are, have asked permission to utilize our equity policy to help them craft their own. And so I think that says a lot about our community and the board. Uh, subsequently to that, um, because Mrs. Ivory and her team were away at a reading conference, I attended another activity relative to reading, and I'm really, really excited. The uh, city schools will partner with Professor Aldridge at the Curry School of Education for a program um, from the Children's Defense Fund called Freedom School. Freedom schools pattern themselves after the freedom schools in the civil rights movement. And here, as in other areas, we will be doing a five-week program for our students. And we're going to do six now. Oh, we got an extra week. Yay. So when I was there, we were doing five. Now we're doing six. But um, they have a, which has not been decided at this point. But they have a national theme, and so all of the Freedom Schools work around that theme. We will be doing uh, additional work uh, with reading. So you will see that our students, uh, over the course of the summer, will have an additional shot in arm with reading, which will complement our reading program. And uh, the focus is uh, an equitable focus, because it's around African American and brown um, uh, curriculum as it relates to whether it's reading, whether it's math, whether it's social science, or whether it's in the sciences. So that gives everyone an additional opportunity to learn some information. Congratulations to our board chair, Ms. McKeever, who will also be our board chair for KTEC. And um, once again, I would like to thank everyone that has worked in order to ensure that what we do every day is 
every child, every learner, every day. Thank you. Um, I wanted to also uh, say thank you to uh, the people who commented earlier, uh, just to also clarify that my uh, intention with respect to the agenda change around board member comments is not that we don't respond to parents, because I don't think that's, that was certainly, that is certainly not my intention, but it is to um, limit our uh, the kind of front ending of our comments so that we have it at the end so when people you know because we have a lot of things at the front end of our comments for our public um, so I'm hoping to change it to basically announcements and responses to parent or responses to the public if there is such a need um, and um, anyway so that's just my intention moving forward I think if there's a issue with that we can discuss that more at, at our retreat or one um, at another frankly just send me an email just to my to me and if you have any issues with that but I, I'm just trying to limit the amount of time that our staff and public are here for the things that are on the agenda on this front page um, and that we can still get it on the record what the things that we have done um, and to that end I will let you know that I did go to the K Tech meeting and um, and I also went to the um, education I'm sorry the advocacy at the state level um, the advocacy um, conference um, in Richmond which was very helpful uh, so I would like to note that 70% of our budget comes from our locality and I'm very grateful for our locality. They've been such incredible supporters of our um, budget uh, and that we just need to maintain and, and um, you know, continue to ask for um, that funding, which really, once you, um, anyway, I just uh, appreciate the superintendent's budget this year as it relates to equity, literacy, and maintaining our workforce um, and maintaining our current level of programming all around. So I think it's a vitally important budget. Um, and I feel like I had other things to say. Um, I particularly appreciated legal aid um, the comment. And I, you know, when you're handed the information from Ms. Smith, it's really hard to process that in the moment. I'm looking forward to looking at that to see if there's anything, um, you know, what what if you know what she said compares to the data? I look forward to kind of exam and analyzing that a little bit more over the next month and seeing what we can do around that. Um, and I would just for my transparency here, I would like to, as I think we have done in the past with respect to literacy, um, and as somebody who, as the chair, I get to kind of have a say in the agenda. But I would like on the agenda, at, and I think I had this idea from Mr. Meyer is to have an update regarding reconfiguration on the agenda every month. So I would like to have that on the agenda every month. It can be in the form of a paragraph from um, our, um, whoever we choose as an architect or designer um, from Public Works. I do not intend this to be necessarily additional staff work, but I do um, would like to have an update from um, and it could be just on the consent agenda or it could be just a written report. It doesn't need to be something we discuss, but it's just something that indicates that this is clearly a priority of this board. And um, even though we don't talk about it all the time, I am talking about it all the time. And you, you know, so just having that update um, to you guys every month would probably be very helpful to you and the public. Um, so. Uh, so I just would like to see that um, and I feel like this is the process we go through to kind of add things to our agenda so um, just confirm that's all I have to say okay that's all I have to say for the moment and I think we'll go next to superintendent comments Thank you, Ms. McKeever, members of the board, and Mr. Henderson, and all here assembled. Um, I want to join Mr. Bryant and members of the board in congratulating the students who came out tonight. Certainly, our Bernard Moran students who are advocating for 
uh, playground at their school. Uh, we love to see our students. We love to see them actively involved in solving real problems, addressing real issues. We are preparing them for life, for sure. And then our MP3 students with the skills that they're learning through the project they're working with. Uh, today, Dr. Atkins, myself, uh, our equity supervisor, Denise Johnson, actually met with Dr. Allridge and some of the UVA staff who are working on the Freedom School project to actually get the ball rolling. Uh, some of us will be going to training along with them. We will have a six-week program for three uh, students who are going into grades three to five, and additional information will be forthcoming. But if anybody in the audience is out there listening, is interested in being the site director for Freedom School, we are looking for an energetic, passionate person who wants to lead a phenomenal program. It's a national program, and they can look on the website and get more information. But we will be posting a job description and hope and hoping in the next couple of weeks to hire somebody for that site coordinator position for Freedom School. We'll have university students actually leading the sessions and they'll be working alongside some of our staff so that um, it becomes a program that Charlottesville City Schools certainly can embrace. Um, Dr. Atkins has also um, she was also at the 2020 Virginia Association of School Superintendents Conference in uh, January, and uh, they talked about uh, budgetary and policy issues that affect uh, what's going on in the school division. And it featured presentations by public policymakers and some of our local, uh, our state officials talking about uh, the budget. Uh, CHS, our high school, had curriculum night on February 3rd, and representatives from each academic department were present to answer questions. One highlight of the program, unsolicited, our students again rising to the task, actually decided to set up a table that said, ask a student, and that you can ask anything. They put up signs showing directions, they knew where teachers were, and nobody asked them to do that. They thought that was a need at the um, curriculum night. And I think our children ought to be congratulated for seeing something that needs to be done and then taking action to do it. So I specifically asked Dr. Irizarry if he congratulated those students and recognized them for that leadership, and he said he did. So we certainly want to congratulate them. And one of them is our own Leslie Thacker's daughter. <laughs> Um, who actually did that. But I think it's, um, it's amazing when our students feel empowered enough to uh, see a need and address the need. So we want to thank them. Buford also had a curriculum night recently, and over 200 families were in attendance at the Buford curriculum night. Uh, then Dr. Atkins. Ms. Ivory, can yes. I interrupt you and just yes. say thank you also to Dr. Irizarry, who had um, curriculum fair at lunch as well for at least three days last week. Wonderful. Um, which I just thought was a real true um, uh, recognition that some families can't make it to the curriculum night and that, you know, there are still questions. So I appreciate Dr. Irizarry's um, efforts on that way. Yes. I know he's probably, right. hopefully he's long gone. But. He's gone, but he'll, we'll, we'll make sure to tell him about that. Thank you so much for that. And then um, Dr. Atkins attended uh, the presentation, of course, Raising Our Children with Equity Versus Equality. And I think everybody now is actually um, joining that bandwagon and really understanding now what equity means. And it doesn't mean that everybody gets the same thing. It certainly means that we address uh, the needs. That group also collected donations of books and those books were given to the students at Greenbrier Elementary School. So we're excited about that. We always want, want to put um, good quality literature in the hands of our students uh, to increase their literacy skills. So if anybody else is interested in donating books, we are happy to receive them. <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> Shameless plug. Yeah. I'll beg for our children. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Ivory. Appreciate it. Um, oh, and the theme for Freedom School will be critical histories. So it's going to be interesting. Great literature. I have seen students get so involved in Freedom School that they're talking about the book so much so that I wanted to read them. So we're going to see phenomenal gains. Yes. Um, I also wanted to mention, I think um, next week is Kindness Week in all of our schools. And I think each school is having like a, a different thing every day. Again, I may have really messed that up, but I know that um, 
it's probably on our website, but uh, look for the flyers associated with Kindness Week. I believe it's next week. Nobody here knows? Okay, cool. <laughs> I get flyers. I read, like, part of them. Anyway, so <laughs> um, look for that. And, Dr. Mr. Henderson, is there anything you wanted to add? Um. I just want here. Take my. I'd like to um, take this moment to inform our families in our community that um, who have rising three-year-old children and four-year-old children that um, Charlottesville City Schools provides um, qual um, free um, classes for qualifying three and four-year-olds, and applications are due March first. So please. Um, you can get an application online, or you can go by one of our um, elementary schools throughout the city. That is an excellent point, Mr. Henderson. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, and I wanted to mention our upcoming meetings. Uh, February 11th, we're having a work session at KTEC at 4 o'clock. That is related to the budget. We'll also be talking about the substitute teacher proposal, I believe. Um, and uh, also, if there's anything else, there'll be uh, that there'll be uh, announcements about that. What the agenda will be on that day, um, February 20th is when our school board uh, will approve the budget at five o'clock here on the 20th. I will not be here. Uh, Ms. Perrier will be our chair at that meeting, and then March 5th um, there will be a school board meeting here again at five o'clock. Um, so we look forward to everybody coming out and making your comments and being engaged. And I believe we have, oops, one more thing, work session wrap up. Dang it. And I added a lot of things to that wrap up, so I feel guilty. February 17th. Yes, the updates are to provide a literacy data that includes tiers, identify available additional literacy supports in schools, and share the equitable literacy supports gained from the literacy conference, provide an update on reconfiguration each month, a paragraph on the consent agenda, or um, it may even be a full report. And I had one more. Wait a minute. Provide a comparison of the impact of the reading curriculum for three and four year olds currently versus previous cohorts. Okay. Um, I have been told that Kindness Week is actually February 17th. So, you know, Hi. random acts of kindness will be appreciated all the time, but certainly during that week, the schools will be celebrating that. Um, are there any other comments or questions? Or, okay. Hearing no objections, we stand adjourned.